Uh, yeah, so today um, I will show you um, how you can use CESA for more efficiency in drug design. Um, CESA really is a, a modern drug discovery suite uh, for the medicinal chemist in the 21st century. So we took um, a little bit of a, a different approach to um, communicate uh, results to the scientist, as you hopefully will be able to see in the next 30 minutes or so. So before I go into discussing a few applications, use cases, and so forth, um, I wanted to briefly introduce our main character today. Uh, for those of you who have not had the chance to work with CESA or take a look at it, um, so CESA is a very intuitive tool that communicates the results in a very visual way. As you can see here, for example, in the screenshot, the ligand bears these affinity coronas. I will explain uh, a little bit later what these coronas mean and in the way they are to be interpreted. So the researcher gets right away an idea of the ligand, how it's situated in the pocket. Let me quickly do the pointer here. Um, arrow. And, um, and, and can see right away uh, how the ligand binds and, and the binding situation. Uh, likewise, for the ligand lipophilic efficiency here, we we have we we report the um, efficiency in a qualitative way as a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, uh, symbol. Then the torsional quality of the ligand, we will take a little bit of a closer look at that later on in one of the use cases as well. You can see how well the overall conformation works in the binding situation. And then, of course, the most important thing here is the estimated affinity. Um, in which region of the scale is the ligand situated that you're currently working on. So um, this whole interface is very beautiful, as I'm hoping you will agree with me. And the most important thing here is that it, it should be fun to use. And if you have fun using a software, I think uh, you will get more productive uh, right from the get-go. So that as a, as a little bit of an introduction. So the use cases for CESA um, that I um, want to talk about today is, um, for example, you want to visualize the protein with or without any co-crystallized ligand. Um, in many cases of structurally enabled projects, uh, you have a wealth of protein structure, hopefully. Some of them are with, some are without a protein. So um, you have the possibility to pick a binding site uh, on the basis of a, a co-crystallized ligand, but if you have an APO structure, for example, then you uh, get to pick a binding site or have to pick a binding site and CESA supports that in a very nice way. Um, to find an alternative binding site also, um, if you want to look for, for example, for an uh, allosteric site or simply want to explore the protein um, in a little bit of a different way. <clears throat> then if you have a co-crystallized ligand present, uh, you can of course modify that um, and that's the whole uh, core of uh, drug discovery, right? You want, as the as the chemist, to explore chemical space, hence also the name CSA, see the SAR around your ligand by modifying it and uh, hopefully finding better alternatives in, in discriminating um, the different variants that you have come up uh, of your ligand and then decide based on the admitox properties, on the affinity, on the uh, conformation, on the li ligand lipophilic efficiency, and so forth. There are cases uh, potentially where you want to evade a patent um, or where you are stuck with a compound um, uh, because the, <clears throat> the, the chemical scaffold doesn't work in, in a specific way that you would like it to work. So you have optimized the, the needles, the, 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 the groups that form the interactions with the receptor. So you're happy with the affinity, but the, the chemical core doesn't work for you. So CESA supports you in replacing that core uh, also in a very intuitive and also efficient way. Um, you might have a fragment from a, a fragment screen that sits in a sub pocket and you would like to explore the pocket, you would like to extend this fragment into the depth of the pocket by utilizing uh, pharmacophores on the, on, the, on the pocket side, for example, you can do that. Um, you can, if you have a list of ligands, explore the binding situation for these ligands, regardless of whether this is simply a SMILES uh, list or a, a, a 2D 
list of ligands, or if you have a, a 3D structure, you can dock these ligands into the pocket and then <clears throat> uh, determine the best binding codes for any given ligand. CESA also supports you in HIT triaging. So if you have a bunch of a thousand or so compounds or more, it's quite um, confusing to see all these and to, to really find the best way. CESA has powerful filtering functions to help you um, do HIT triaging in a very intuitive way as well. And then uh, this comes again a little bit um, uh, associated with the binding pose finding here. Um, eliminate, uh, uh, eliminate compounds as well with bad physical chemical properties um, is an, an, an additional um, parameter set, so to say, um, where you can go beyond the binding affinity of, of a pose. Um, uh, some poses might have a very a binding post that's very close to each other, so you have no meaningful way to discriminate them. Um, but if you if you do that, um, then you can uh, find a subset that has um, beneficial uh, physical chemical properties, or you can also discriminate the poses based on the uh, tightness of fit. And I will go over a few of these examples. So before I show these examples, let me delve a little bit into the theory of CESA. Um, and I hope this is not going to be too confusing. Don't pay too much attention to these names here. They, they don't really uh, play such a big role, uh, but I will mention a few of those um, when I go over the videos later, the, the, the example videos. Um, there are a few tools that will be mentioned also that you see in CESA, and then you hopefully will remember what they do. So um, CESA is full of components that really help, um, on the one hand, prepare the ligand and the protein, in a way that you can be sure that the data that you're using is sound and, and correct. Um, then the core of the, um, of the software is the affinity prediction. Um, and then we have the active site placements of ligand and the so-called inspirator. So for the ligand and protein preparation, we are using a tool called Naomi that's, that makes sure that the ligands uh, bonds and angles and, and hybridization states are all correct. Uh, PROTOS takes care of the hydrogen bond network, protonation states, and tautomeres of the ligand and the amino acids of the protein. Um, this will become necessary in the next slide, um, where I will show uh, a little bit more about affinity prediction. Um, and then dog site scorer is a binding site finder um, that will be handled also in one of the use cases. So again, you, you can't forget about the name, but you might recognize this when I uh, show the corresponding example. The core of the software is the affinity prediction. That's a very neat tool to, um, of a larger ligand set, flush the interesting compounds to the top, the ones that bind the uh, most tightly to the uh, receptor. Um, or if you if you modify your ligand uh, bit by bit, then it helps you discriminate um, in in which route which route you should take, whether you should go uh, with that change or another change. And if you create a bunch of variants over the course of an hour or two, um, you can actually end up with a set of fifty or a hundred, and then it becomes necessary to have a, a meaningful way to decide which ones uh, should be follow up, um, either in silico or uh, maybe in the lab. And the tool that does that is called HIDE for hydrogen bonding and desolvation. It's a scoring function. I will have one slide on that later just to give you an idea what this is based on. And HIDE is preceded by PROTOS and a, a crude force field optimization. Then we have the active site placement, which is done by FlexX. Uh, FlexX uses an enthalpic anentropic algorithm to place the ligand inside the active site, explore the conformations and the, the different interactions with the receptor and then uh, spits out the most uh, promising poses that then eventually will be scored by height and again you can then decide uh, which on which of the poses are the best ones and then lastly we have the inspirator this is a, a, a two-fold or a two-tiered um, way to uh, explore new chemistries. Once is the core replacement, which is done by ReCore, hence the name Replace Core. And the other one is a fragment growing that's based on a manual placement docking approach where you utilize um, uh, pharmacophores on the protein surface. 
So that was a little bit of a dry slide, and I promise this will be the second driest slide. The next one uh, is this here, and then we'll be done with the theory and get back to the beautiful GUI. Um, CESA uses a three-step affinity prediction. As I mentioned on the previous slide, PROTOS optimizes the hydrogen bond network within the protein and with the ligand. And this is necessary so that we can find as many hydrogen bonds as possible. So as you can imagine, a hydrophilic atom like the oxygen, when you take it out of the solvent, this is an energetically unfavorable process. You will lose about one to two orders of magnitude in binding affinity if this oxygen is not forming a hydrogen bond inside the receptor um, with the protein. Um, and only if this uh, hydrogen bond is of good geometry and it's actually existing, uh, that's the most important fact, but then it also needs to be of good geometry, will the penalty that you get from desolvating, dehydrating this oxygen be overcompensated. So we need to have as many hydrogen bonds as possible. And then the next criterion is to get the best possible geometry for these hydrogen bonds. And that's done with a force field that relaxes the ligand inside this hydrogen bond network. The force field is based on a, a Leonard Jones inter and intramolecular clash term, basically. Uh, and then um, a weighted term for the hydrogen bonding and the dehydration. <clears throat> and then the, the third step is that Hyde calculates the affinity based on this rather simple equation here. The change in free energy of binding is the sum over all atoms I of the change in free energy of dehydration and the change in free energy for hydrogen bonding. And these two here are intimately linked to each other by the partial log p increment for the eight atom types that we are using in Hyde. Um, so it's a very consistent description of the binding process. And uh, for us, this, this works very well. We are, we are um, very happy in the way that we can describe even um, unusual contexts um, or unusual uh, arrangements of um, halogen atoms in, in the receptor, for example. So, uh, the, the hyped topic of halogen bonds, for example, can in the most cases described through dehydration effects. So <clears throat> this uh, phenomenon, the, the delta G um, that I just described on the previous slide will then be expressed by the so-called affinity coronas. And we have a ligand uh, bound to the protein here where, for example, this oxygen atom <clears throat> has a red affinity corona. What, what does this mean now? Well, it's pretty intuitive. Red means bad, as you can see by the energetic contribution here that this atom makes to the binding affinity. The size also corresponds directly to the amount that this atom is contributing. So the situation is as follows here. We have a desolvation penalty for the ligand mostly, a little bit for the receptor, but there is no hydrogen bonding of the ligand and the uh, between the ligand and the receptor. So this penalty that both the ligand and the receptor atom, uh, atoms um, incurred cannot be overcompensated and therefore we have a penalty of 5.4 kilojoules. So that's, that's more than one order of magnitude in binding affinity already. Here we have uh, the counter case where we have a green corona, a good contribution to the overall affinity. You can see that also here both the ligand and the receptor incurred a big a dehydration penalty the ligand for this nitrogen, the receptor for the two uh, carboxylates here. But in this case, we have two hydrogen bonds of strong, of good geometry that are very strong, which you can also see by the color. Dark green here means good geometry, lighter green or white is bad geometry. And this hydrogen bond energy is rewarded with minus 10.1 and minus 10.3 kilojoules per mole, which then overcompensates this penalty and we get a net gain of energy of minus 4.2 kilojoules per mole. So you don't always need to look at these labels. They help you uh, sometimes uh, get a better picture of the binding situation, but I hope you will agree with me that just by looking at this picture here, you see that there's a problem here and uh, uh, this is these are basically not contributing at all. They have a tiny, tiny, tiny penalty, but they, that doesn't play such a big role. But overall, the binding situation looks pretty good of this ligand. Okay, so let's come to the use cases here. Let's start with the most simple one, visualize my protein. I have here a screenshot of CESA. Um, and the first thing that you can do is you can load a, a PDB here. 
Um, you can type the PDB code that you would like to see. In our case, we will use 3IPH. And then this ligand will be pulled directly from the PDB website and, the, uh, and downloaded. <coughs> and then the, um, the binding energy will be, the affinity will be estimated based on height, which you can see down here. Um, it's a pretty tight binding ligand. And then you can click on this ligand um, in the ligand uh, window and you see a more detailed picture of the binding situation inside the protein. You see also the backbone of the protein uh, in cartoon view, of course. Uh, and you can then investigate uh, your ligand, where it is situated, how it is binding. You can look at the affinity coronas and therefore get, get a little bit of an overview be before you start, um, uh, for example, um, uh, using this ligand or importing other ligands and then <clears throat> continue with your um, modification or with your um, investigation of, of this protein. So then once you have loaded your ligand, you might uh, want to explore how you can use either the existing uh, binding um, site or um, explore other binding sites. So in our case, we would select the binding site such that we would click the ligand and then use the defined binding site of this molecule. If you decide to find a different binding mode, you can uh, go to the protein section and use the same button for the protein and then click this button, uh, define binding site, which will then detect all unoccupied pockets on the protein. And once this uh, quick calculation has finished, we will see uh, these unoccupied pockets of the protein in a very colorful uh, scheme and you have to select one. So that's what you just saw. You cannot go out without selecting one. Um, so you, you would choose one of these foggy areas and then um, once you have decided which one to use, you click on it and you see how the amino acids are uh, appearing and then you have to confirm this selection and once you do that, you see that uh, down below in the sequence view, you get the entire Binding, site, uh, binding sites amino acid listed, and you could then further um, either, uh, um, so to say, um, mute these amino acids, meaning you click on them and they will vanish. They will still be there for the calculation, but you could um, uh, unvisualize un un them in order to make a, a better view, for example, if you want to take a screenshot and um, an amino acid is in the way um, of your ligand. And so to make the ligand uh, um, view better, you could deselect these amino acids. Um, <clears throat> so then probably the most prominent use case and most important use case is modify your ligand. And so I have done this entire preparation here that we've seen. I have loaded the PDB file. I have selected um, a binding site. I have transferred the ligands over to the uh, editor or ligands and editor tab. Um, so let me now show you uh, what you can do here. So you can select a ligand from this window in order to um, edit it. You click the edit button and then the coronas vanish and you can select atoms, for example, to do something with them. Anytime you um, select them, um, you can, for example, go up in the editor and then add a ring, or you can select an atom and type an N on a keyboard, as I just did here, um, and the, the atom type will be changed, type a two on the keyboard, then the bond type will be changed. Once you're happy with your edits, you can then save this ligand to the table, and then, of course, you want to know how well does this ligand bind, and for that, you click this thumbs up uh, symbol, which will calculate the affinity for this ligand, and here, uh, let me pause this for a while, you can see that um, this wasn't such a good edit because for once we see that the affinity here dropped down dramatically. The LLE uh, is, has a thumbs down. The torsion is not so, <clears throat> not so prominent. Um, and here on these two carbon atoms, we have two huge dehydration penalties because um, the um, receptor amino acids here and here these two um, they are not entering any hydrogen bond situation. So the unhappiness in quotation marks of these uh, three amino acids is mapped onto the ligand. There's a big problem going on that we now need to take care of. And so we want to continue with the editing on the optimized structure and simply make uh, this carbon atom a nitrogen and see what happens with our affinity. 
And so the affinity will be calculated again. And as you can see now, just by changing this very atom here, we get two very nice hydrogen bonds with the backbone of the protein. The ligand is optimized a little bit and moved upwards. And now the two de big dehydration penalties on the carbons uh, are gone. And, and uh, the, the carbon that we changed into a nitrogen is very happy with this uh, situation here. And most importantly, the affinity here goes up um, even and is even a little bit better than what we started from. So this is really all we care about. The difference um, in affinities between different ligands here, not necessarily by how much we want. Uh, we just want to uh, see in which direction are we moving here. And as long as we are moving into this direction, um, then we can be happy. So um, the last thing is that um, we want to check the, um, the torsions here. And when we engage the torsion uh, coloring, we see that this is a yellow torsion. So we need to attend this a little bit by, entering, uh, by, by adding a methyl group, which will lock this ring conformation uh, into a very um, beneficial conformation. And then the torsion will jump from yellow to green. And we can then simply uh, save all the ligands that we have now generated and <clears throat> basically continue with, the, with these last two, uh, which are in the same area for the affinity here. But um, when we discriminate uh, on, on this particular conformation here, this one will be even a little bit better because that's what you can't see now. But if you uh, would engage the surface of the protein here, then um, we would be able to see that the methyl group is pointing right into a pocket um, that is locking this ring system um, into a very uh, beneficial conformation. Okay, so <clears throat> then uh, another use case was, for example, to replace your ligand score. Um, and I'm going to do uh, this with, in this example here, I have loaded um, a ligand uh, in the protein. Um, and you see, I, I go through the entire process here. I have defined the binding site based on the existing ligand. Um, and you have to take note that the 2D window and the ligand uh, overlap a little bit. So you have to move this up and down. Um, but then I move over my molecule to the molecules tab, calculate the affinity again to see with which I'm starting here. And then I can investigate again. I can look at my protein. I can see uh, what does my backbone look like? Where's my binding site exactly? How does the binding site look like? Where's the ligand situated in this situation? And when I'm done with my overview, I can then um, uh, turn off the, the backbone, which will make the whole uh, view a little bit easier. Um, and then I can see uh, where I really need to set my cuts towards my core that I wish to replace. And I can do this in two ways. I can do this in the 2D window. By clicking twice on the bond, I change the direction of this vector that I set. And then I can go to the 3D window and place the second vector, for example. And then all I need to do is uh, click this upper button for core replacement. And then ReCore will search um, an indexed fragment database such that the um, fragments that I introduce are um, not disturbing the overall conformation too much. Um, this depends a little bit on what kind of database I'm using. Um, and um, of course, uh, when, I, when I'm in a, in a protein situation, then the conformation might be um, uh, changing a little bit when we do the, the calculation here. As you remember, we do a force field optimization, which also optimize the, <clears throat> the conformation. And in order to get the best possible contribution for each atom, uh, the force field is sometimes um, the second in a row um, when we get a better contribution for an atom uh, that then has more contribution for a hydrogen bond. So you can see that the <clears throat> estimated affinities are all over the place. So let's just sort by affinity. And we can see that there is one example where we are actually even a little bit better than the crystal structure ligand. We have a piperidine ring here with, with an inverted amino group, which, was, which used to be here when you remember the first, uh, the original uh, co-crystal structure. Um, and this is actually a, a quite nice a change. You can see here the, the crystal structure again. This is similar to the crystal structure. And here the next one uh, that I show is again an inverted one. 
with the benzene ring, that's of course not so uh, exciting a change, but uh, this is, I guess, a pretty nice one. And you can then again, leave the editor and save all these ligands um, uh, to your table and then uh, investigate on the other parameters that you see here. Um, so for for uh, for the first set here, the LLE is is mediocre. It's not great, but it's it's still bearable. Um, of course, the torsions are um, a little bit to worry about, um, but that's something that one would address now um, with the fine tuning. So you can use the results from from this inspirator as a starting point uh, for getting a new core and maybe get some new ideas and then start. Uh, the manual editing, as we've seen in the previous example, where we can change atoms and add groups and uh, do further changes uh, to the ligand. So see this as an idea generator um, uh, to get a new um, uh, chemical scaffold. So then <clears throat> our next example is hit triaging. And um, here we start by loading a project. Of course, we can save projects with all the ligands that we have generated. Uh, we don't need to start from scratch. That would be um, not so convenient. You can see that here um, there is, uh, the, the affinity is, is, well, a little bit varied, but um, for, the, for, the upper, for the first ligands uh, in this set, they, it's pretty close. Um, and so, uh, what we can do here is then obviously again sort by affinity, uh, but you can see that it's really hard to discriminate that. Um, the first ligand here, uh, which is ligand 848, um, has an interesting uh, binding situation, um, but the torsion is not so good. Um, but at least there are no penalties for desolvation. Ligand number five uh, looks good torsion wise has a good binding situation, has a similar core um, to, uh, towards the outer rim of the pocket. Um, as I mentioned, good torsion. Um, what we want to do now is, um, because we have so many of these ligands in the set, uh, about 800 to 1,000, we can now start to filter these down and to really do hit triaging. So we can add a filter for all sorts of things, pharmacophores, a number of hydrogen bond donors, so all the Lipinski rules, we can, for example, filter by the torsional quality. So let's just look at the, um, the ones, the ligands with good torsions. And then for example, um, uh, give uh, all the ligands with low affinity towards uh, 2D6 here for, um, for toxicity. Um, <clears throat> and then as a last um, parameter, we wanna uh, do a, a HERG value here, HERG filter and uh, use only ligands that are smaller than or equal to four. And that leaves us with 70, uh, 27 ligands. As you can see, uh, they still have good affinity. Um, all of these, of course, have good uh, torsions. The affinity is a little bit inferior to the original co-crystal structure ligand, but not too much. So we are still in the same ballpark, very much so. And we can now again study the remaining ligands. Um, and for example, this one is, is, is a good one um, because we have a lot of polar groups that are pointing um, uh, to the uh, outer uh, uh, binding site uh, towards the solvent. So <clears throat> you can see that we have a very powerful filter functions for if you, if you did a, a high virtual throughput screen, for example, and you have up to 50,000 compounds in CESA, um, you need to boil down this list uh, quite dramatically and, and these filter functions really, really help you in um, identifying the ligands that have the most beneficial uh, physical chemical properties for your set um, and also the best affinity. So these could then be uh, taken directly to the lab and, and be made. Okay, and then the last use case that I would like to show you today is um, discriminating between poses. Um, you can see in this example here that the binding affinities for all these poses, uh, these are docked poses. I had docked this before I saved the project. Um, uh, you can see that the binding surface, uh, the, this binding site is very closed, very tight. So it's really hard to access. Um, and um, although the ligand fills the site uh, pretty nicely, it's really hard to see where it fills this uh, or where there might be a better opportunity for filling this binding site. 
So what we have in there is um, what I'll show in a second. So when you when you look at the the two uh, uh, dominating binding sites here, it also based on the affinity coronas, it's hard to discriminate uh, which of the binding sites is correct. So <clears throat> what we have is something called uh, the fog. It's it's showing you uh, unoccupied space in the pocket. And when you uh, see these two binding poses now, it, it's it's pretty clear to see which one is the correct one. So the one that uh, with the chlorine towards us is not the correct one, whereas this one is the right one because the tightness of fit is a little bit better. Um, you see there's, it's, there's less room um, for placing at least a fluorine atom. And so wherever we see less fog, the tightness of fit is more pronounced. And then um, we, can, we can really determine the correct binding pose um, if we have a situation like here where we can't really say um, uh, which, which of these poses um, uh, binds better uh, to the protein. Okay, this was a lot of information. Um, I hope uh, you're still... Thank you very much. Um, the last slide I have is, is also the summary. So I hope I was able to convince you that CESA is really fun and, and easy to use. Uh, the, the way that we designed this graphical user interface is really based on a lot of um, feedback from our customers. So um, the, the customers really are driving the development at Biosolv IT, where we are constantly prodding them uh, you know, for use cases, for improving use cases and so forth. So uh, this, this, all this goes down into the development and, and lastly then in the, uh, in, the, in the software that you see before your eyes. So uh, the community is a big part of the development um, really. Um, and, and the way that we've designed this is that, it, that facts should be communicated visually rather than by numbers. So you know how stressful it is on the eye to see a row of numbers um, uh, and they, they don't really tell you much um, without taking a deeper look. So just by taking one glance, you can see, um, for example, how a set of ligands uh, works out uh, in terms of how the atoms contribute to binding or um, how the <clears throat> conformation of the ligand um, uh, is, is situated and, and so forth. So uh, we think this is very important because numbers distract a lot and um, this way it really helps to facilitate make a decision um, uh, quicker uh, and and uh, without compromising the uh, the rationale behind it. Um, and then uh, the, the use cases that I'm shown is in our eyes, uh, in any case, the most important ones that are needed for successful drug discovery and design. So um, it's really necessary uh, because you're working in silico to get a first uh, qualitative view at um, the physical chemical properties of your molecules. Hence, we have all these admitox properties in there um, that I showed you in the hit triaging example. Um, but most importantly, how tight does the ligand bind? And that's, uh, that's really a, a very important uh, criterion to uh, decide which ligands should be remaining in the set and, and then later on uh, uh, taken uh, up for synthesis, for example, and tested. Um, and yeah, well then, CESA is of course for everybody. It's not just for the medicinal chemist, but it's also, it can be used of course by computational chemists who like to um, discuss uh, with, the, with the medchems. Um, it should facilitate the, <clears throat> the uh, collaboration between uh, different sets of chemists and maybe even biologists and, and so forth. So um, crystallographers, for example, use it too. So uh, CESA really is for the people who like to to use a fun tool and who like to be more efficient in their um, in their daily work. And so with that, I would like to thank all of you for your attention and I hand it back to Marcus. Thanks very much, Carsten. Um, and we do have attentiveness here from quite a bunch of people and we actually have a bunch of questions piled up. Here is one from the US East Coast, um, but this was a bit before you actually um, would dive into the Inspirator part. You are using CESA in a manual way, so this dropped in when you were editing manually. Could you use it to make some suggestions? So beyond the Inspirator that you uh, that you showed, perhaps you want to comment on something like pipelining, etc. as well, Carsten? 
Uh, yeah, so you can use CISA, for example, in uh, something like NIME or Pipeline Pilot, uh, where then um, CISA is, is popping up um, and, and giving you the possibility to, uh, to make a few changes. But you can also address the, 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 the height scoring, for example, uh, from within the command line. So um, you, can, <clears throat> you can script uh, this as well if you like. But of course, this is not really the intention of Using it, um, the intention really is to to be interactive and to use the graphical user interface to get the feedback from the software, the visual feedback. That's that's the most important one uh, that we feel is uh, making people more efficient in their drug discovery. But you can address uh, the the, for example, the affinity prediction um, from within the command line. I hope this this answers the question. Yeah, if not, just uh, feel free to type in a question again and we'll put it on the stack. Thanks very much. So the next question is, um, do we have to prepare a database or an index for recall before running recall or is it already a part of CSA? That depends on what you wish to use there. So there are a bunch of um, uh, uh, indices available or will be available. For now, we have uh, available one. Uh, that's that that you can use um, within CISA, um, and, uh, and in 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 a in a little bit of time, and I can't really say when, but um, later down the road, um, it you will be able to use um, CISA also, hopefully to pre to prepare uh, an index file um, uh, that you can then use from within uh, CISA and using Recore. Um, if you wish to use different indices, such as the uh, CSD, for example, um, or your own uh, set of molecules, uh, then you would still have to go through our lead IT software, which is um, uh, almost equally fun to use. Um, but of course, it's a little bit older than CISA. Um, but that would give you more freedom in deciding what sort of index you would be using. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question is, um, when doing hit triaging, say for example, I have 1000 hits after my virtual screen and I upload these into CISA, does CISA then uh, change the 3D coordinates? Does it reposition the ligand using FlexX, for example, or does it retain the pose that I had used as an input, which was an output from another program? So, it, so in principle, can you also use other docking programs? I think that's what be, what's behind this this question and load these um, into CISA. So I, I have to answer with yes and no. So as you have seen in the first two use cases that I showed that when you load a protein structure um, and you load the ligand, then the ligand is optimized um, in the active site and uh, that, entice, uh, that entails using uh, a force field. When you use CISA, with a set of ligands that are not placed inside an active site yet, uh, nothing will be done to the uh, to the conformation or the position of the ligand, obviously, because it's not in an, in an active site. Um, if you have a set of a thousand ligands, this is not triggered automatically, uh, the, the optimization and the affinity prediction. Um, you have to trigger this manually in CISA, and you can either select a, a, a set of ligands or you can do this with all of them. Um, and in addition to that, you can also decide to redock all these ligands into your um, active site, or if they are not even placed yet, you can dock them into the active site. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, it's depending on, so, so for the co-crystal structure ligand, uh, <clears throat> the crystal structure will always be a little bit different than the structure, than the pose of the ligand that you will see, because we use this force field on it, um, but every other ligand other than the crystal structure, you have to trigger it manually. Yeah, perhaps I can, can comment from this side. Uh, so I think this also referred to the use case where you just have your own favorite docking program, which by some un not hardly understandable reason may not be um, FlexX or something like this. And you import this um, into CSAR, which has a binding site defined. In that moment, we do not change the coordinates, but um, when you click hide, when you score it, then we do a mini pre-optimization and check that there is no clash, etc. So in principle, the pose will stay. We will just make sure 
that there is no residual clash or strain in, in the component there. So you can use your third party program if you desire. So perhaps this was an addendum to the to the answer that you gave, Carsten. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Um, how important is protein resolution? So I think this refers to the um, prediction power uh, of Hyde. Yes, uh, protein resolution is very important. Um, so again, you want to be able to have the best possible hydrogen bond geometry um, to get, at, in, in an ideal case, get the um, dehydration penalty overcompensated, right? So if you are on, if if the protein resolution is bad and you don't really know where your residues are or you're not 100% or close to 100% certain where your residues are this might be a problem so in order to give you a, a most reliable affinity prediction for your ligand you need to have a highly resolved protein structure uh, typically um 1.0 to 1.5 uh, a little bit higher maybe angstrom resolution is ideal of course we don't always have that right if if we don't have a good resolved uh, well resolved crystal structure uh, we have to we have to see that we make a trade off right do you want to get ideas or do you rather not so that's up to you to decide then but you have to treat the results maybe a little bit more careful when you when you um, sacrifice resolution Yep. Um, can you work with RNA, uh, for example, ribosomes or only proteins? Um, so the yes, question so the nice are we parametrized to protein ligand complexes, I think. So the nice thing about the scoring part of CISA is that it's not param parametrized to any sort of target. So it's agnostic of the target and therefore it can be used with any sort of proteins, uh, RNAs, DNAs. Um, that's uh, totally up to you to, to decide. Um, has entropy been accounted for in high affinity predictions? Good question. Yeah, so uh, it, entropy has been in, uh, introduced through the back door, so to say, um, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the hydrogen bonding part. Um, there is uh, a, 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 a parameter which is called the F, uh, sub factor. That's the saturation of the hydrogen bond network and that's a temperature dependent uh, parameter. So uh, of course the hydrogen, um, 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 the, the number of hydrogen bonds will change in the solvent um, depending on the temperature um, and therefore um, th we, we basically introduce the entropy through the back door. Okay. Um, will there be the ability in the future to prepare the protein better? For example, uh, get assistance for homology model uh, support or generation and mutate residues? Yeah, so um, I can't speak so much for generating homology models and, and I wouldn't necessarily count that towards uh, protein preparation. That's really an a entire field in itself, homology modeling. But mutating residues is on our list. Um, in fact, um, it, it's really sort of, it was part of the question that we asked, um, you know, uh, what sort of amino acid selection so should we have? And in addition to that, beyond that would be then not only the selection, but also the, the mutation. So, um, of course, it would be interesting to see how a ligand, for example, would behave in a mutated protein. So that's on our list, but um, I can't promise you when this will be a part of CISA. Uh, what kind of interactions does CISA recognize? Would it recognize a, um, a nitrogen that is planar and um, coordinates to an iron, for example? So the height scoring function uh, contains hydrogen bonding and desolvation. That's that's it. Um, it uh, and it, it has eight atom parameters. Um, of which um, we have uh, four for nitrogen, three for oxygen, and one for hydrophobic interactions. And, and beyond that, there, there are no interactions uh, in, this, in the height scoring function. Is there a final score, or should we sum up all the coronas in order to get a delta G value? 
Yeah, that's a good question. In the first version of Hyde, we had sped out, uh, so to say, the uh, delta G value. However, the, the problem here was that people tended to overestimate the numerical value. That's why we decided to, uh, to, visu to visually communicate the affinity with this error bar in a more qualitative way. Um, when you save a ligand to an SDF file, you will get a range with a numerical value. It's still a range, but you can, you can guess the numerical value with uh, sort of the error incorporated um, for any set of ligands. If you want to have a more um, concise uh, value that you would have to sum it up. Yeah. Okay, very technical question. What's the difference uh, for FlexX with respect to uh, CSAR versus lead IT? In lead IT, basically you can, um, uh, select and change a few more parameters. So in CSAR, we CSAR we designed with the uh, with the user in mind, who maybe doesn't want to deal so much with with parameters in a way that you have to study a user guide all the time before you can actually start to work. Um, so f let's put it this way: FlexX in Lead IT is more of a full version, whereas CSAR contains FlexX in a a little bit more simplified version. You can still use the pharmacophores, um, but for example, you will uh, see uh, only the first 10 poses of a docking, um, whereas in FlexX, you can decide whether you wanna see only the first one, the only the first 10 or all of them. Um, so if you wanna go the more thorough way and look at really all the poses, uh, you would have to do docking in lead IT. So here's one that ties into um, your recent talk at the ACS. Are not so known types of interactions considered, such as halogen bonds, chalcogen bonds, aromatic protons, aromatic yeah. high clouds, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, the short answer is no. Uh, and so as I pointed out before, Hyde looks at desolvation or dehydration and, um, and hydrogen bonding only. Uh, and only is not meant in a derogative way, but it's it's really the simplicity of the uh, of the scoring function that I think is its biggest strength. Um, and although we are agnostic of these of all these not so common types of interactions, um, we have started to look into, for example, the halogen bonding phenomenon, and we found that we can explain uh, ninety five percent of the cases, if not more, through desolvation effects. Um, and so we really think we are going the right way by, by being agnostic of these uh, interactions. It, we have the idea of maybe visualizing them to make you aware that there could be something more, but we don't really need them in order to calculate our um, affinity. In what context uh, could CISA be useful in a no protein available uh, situation? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I haven't even mentioned that. So, <clears throat> for example, the inspirator um, can be used to um, in a ligand-based fashion, where you simply want to look at different scaffolds of um, of, of a ligand and get new ideas. Um, you can <clears throat> simply load a ligand or just start drawing ligands um, in CSA by, for example, uh, uh, importing a smiles uh, string, for example, for benzene. Um, drag and drop it into the into the window, and then you have a benzene ring in there, which you can start to build up into a molecule. Um, a little bit down the road, we and that's also why we asked the question how important that was for the audience um, and the and the community um, that we will be able to um, extract, for example, pharmacophores from from ligands and use those then. But that's that's of course going also a little bit into the direction of structure based. Uh, design um, because um, you then you know might might be wanting to have the the protein um, information as well for for using the pharmacophore, but you could also use it in a ligand based fashion. Yeah, it's interesting that we have thirty five percent of people uh, giving support for more uh, functionality in the LBDD field here. So we we listen to you and uh, we hope to get something more on track. In that direction, I think. Maybe yeah. adding to this, so so as I pointed out in the beginning, the, the, the backbone of CISA really is this affinity prediction. And there's, of course, no affinity prediction without uh, protein. So although you um, can use it 
in, in some ligand based ways, uh, the predominant application would be in structurally enabled projects. Uh, I think you wetted uh, you wetted the mouth of somebody here. Um, what's in the pipeline for covalent in inhibitors? Can you comment on this? Uh, so we are aware of the 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 need for some of our users, and um, we we did in former versions of FlexX had the possibility to dock covalently. Um, but that was a way that we would not offer this anymore to our users because it was a little bit, um, uh, it, re it required tinkering a little bit with the software and we, we don't want that anymore. So um, I can't tell you uh, for sure in time, um, it is on our list, um, but that is all I can say for now. It depends really how, so we, as, as you can imagine, we are seeing users and customers all the time um, we are talking to people at conferences, and so this will be our uh, feedback that we get for, you know, how important covalent inhibitors are. And if we feel that that really there is a strong, strong need in the community for it, it'll be moving up our list, and then you will see it rather sooner than later. Uh, is there tools appropriate for macrocycles in your portfolio? Uh, Macro cycles only uh, until uh, I think nine members. Um, everything beyond that will be treated in a rigid way. Um, you can cheat a little bit if you cut the macro cycle open um, and then you can do everything you want. But for example, if you want to dock uh, a macro cycle, that will be treated in a rigid way. So you'd have to, you'd have to sort of find a way around that. How about using CESA for virtual screening uh, with a realistic time scale? Yeah, that's a good question too. So yes, you can do that. Um, as far as I'm aware, CESA can handle up to 50,000 molecules. Uh, <clears throat> and if you have a, a later computer with uh, hyper-threading capabilities, um, you can, you, uh, w when you decide to dock your ligands and you in engage that, then um, FlexX will be using each of these uh, cores of your processor. So if you have an eight core, it'll use all eight uh, cores at the same time. So that's that's a pretty uh, realistic time scale, even for 50,000 molecules. However, what I have to say is that keep in mind that only uh, that 10 poses per ligand are um, retained. So that will limit your set to 50 uh, to 5,000 um, ligands that you can that you can dock and then you're at the, at, at the maximum. But it's, I mean, docking 5,000 in a software like that is, I don't know, it, it's, it's something that I wouldn't do anyway. I mean, I would probably not do more than 1,000 anyway, or even 500. So it, it really depends on your use case behind this. Is your protein flexible? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> so it's not flexible with respect to the backbone, but um, as I showed on the theory slide, we do change or we do adapt the hydrogen bond network. So all the hydroxyl rotors, the protonation states, the tautomeres, um, all this is moving around. And every time you make one single tiny little change on your ligand, uh, this uh, Protoss software is engaged again so that the hydrogen bond network will be optimized then the force field optimizes the pose of the ligand um, and then <clears throat> the the affinity of the ligand is calculated so it's a little bit flexible how would five or six member ring confirmations then be handled during the docking uh, as far as i'm aware the maybe you can say more to this marcus because you're closer to the development but as far as i'm aware we do um, so if, you t if you're talking of um, uh, cyclohexane, we would look at this in boat and, and chair confirmation. Um, is that correct? Do we do that? Yeah, so essentially the ligand is chopped into pieces, that's right, and ring structures are retained. And if we do not have a confirmation for those, we try uh, to generate the, um, the most likely one using <clears throat> a ring library underneath. If we do not find something appropriate in the ring library, we use a force field to actually propose um, the top squad ones, and then these will be tried out subsequently along the way, and uh, the best ones uh, that survive will be subjected to the final scoring. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, it's uh, six o'clock here in Germany in the evening, so we have consumed the entire hour. Thanks very much for everybody contributing with questions. Thanks very much for listening. Let me use uh, the last few seconds to um, make you again aware of the scientific challenge, uh, dear academic listeners. Um, and for the next webinar, please just uh, observe the, the web page, Biosolvity dot com slash webinars and if you have further questions that remained unresolved here then feel free to write us to webinar at biosolvitv.de dot de or com that doesn't matter and actually um yeah everybody who, who logged in and listened here will be um, extra rewarded with a license with a one month free license to uh, play with caesar and profit from the software and please feel free to uh, to to give us feedback yeah let us know um, about your rejoicing about the very unlikely event of not being happy with the tool etc etc we are here and we never sleep and uh, our ears and eyes are very open and interested in your feedback thanks much carsten at this point in time and uh, thank you with this i will leave you to go carsten you have your last sentence um before we can then close the webinar thanks again <laughs> well th thanks again for for this webinar i hope it was useful for everyone and again write to us if you have suggestions questions problems uh if you want to test anything beyond CISA. Um, our website gives um, a wealth of information on what we what else we can offer. For example, the real space navigator that you might have seen on the intro slides uh, before we started the webinar uh, webinar is a, a very useful tool to find um, um, alternative molecules in a project that can then directly be ordered from enamine. So within three weeks, an eighty percent success rate. They can they can send you back the real molecule for, for in vitro testing. So that's a really cool tool that you uh, should check out. And um, in addition to that, we have a wealth of other software that might be interesting um, for you. So check out our website. And um, the next webinar will very likely be in, no, will definitely be in April. Um, Andrea Volkammer will talk about uh, toxicity using chem informatics to address toxicity challenges. Uh, and we hope that all of you will be our guest again for that. Uh, check the webinar webpage on biosolvity.com for more information on that.